Good afternoon. We're here today to celebrate the extraordinary life of our friend Jack Leach. My name's Hal DeArm, and I've been a longtime friend of Jack. Jack Prather Leach, born August 20th, 1934. Jack passed away March 1st, 2024 in Modesto, California. He was born in Neosho, Missouri to Floyd and Jesse Leach. The family moved to Manteca, California during the Great Depression. He met and married Cornelia Galt, the love of his life, and they settled in the Modesto area, raising their two children Allison and Eric. A graduate of Chico State and the University of the Pacific, he began a long and successful career in education. He was an elementary teacher, principal, and later a school psychologist. He was a steadfast advocate for students with disabilities. His commitment to education was matched by his passion for sports, especially baseball. He coached countless little league teams throughout the years. He competed in all sports as a youth and in senior softball leagues into his 80s. He played in bands throughout his life. He also loved farming, gardening, cooking family feast, wine, poker playing, road trips, and crossword puzzles. His life was greatly enriched by the relationships he formed through his work and activities. He loved sharing in the successes of former students, colleagues, players, teammates, ukulele friends, and decades-long poker buddies. Visits from students, players, and friends touched him deeply later in life. Family was front and center, and he loved time spent with his many nieces, nephews, grandchildren, great-grandchildren, and extended family. He was preceded in death by his wife of 65 years, Cornelia. He is survived by three sisters, Lualis Kellerman, Peggy Himes Kershaw, and Betty Burr. He is also survived by his children Allison and Eric, grandchildren Alexander Leach, Max Leach, and Hannah Martinez, great-grandchildren Lexi Leach, Behar Leach, Bose Leach, Michael Martinez, and Mateo Martinez, as well as many nieces and nephews. We're going to do our uh, presentation today by video, thanks to Ken White and Lee Delano for their technical expertise and for all for all the speakers who will be participating. Let's begin with our first speaker, Jack's daughter, Allison. Hi, I'm Allison Leach. I'm here to give you a little history on my dad's early life. He was born in Neosho, Missouri in 1934 to Jesse and Floyd Leach and is the second of four children. He has three sisters. On their way to Oregon, which was their destination from Missouri, they got to Lathrop, California and needed some money. So his dad found work on a dairy and was able to obtain his own herd and property after a little while. And during that time, dad helped cut bale and bale hay. He also helped with the milking and cleaning out the barn stalls. His, uh, his education was at a single room class room in, called Rustic School, and I believe he was there from kindergarten through eighth grade, not sure on that. Um, in junior high, he met my mom at the fireman's picnic in Manteca, and from there, it was just love forever. Um, he went to Manteca High School, where he loved sports, music, and theater. He then went to Modesto Junior College to get his general education. They were married, he and my mom, Cornelia, were married in 1957, and they shared a love of cars and traveling and birds and flowers. My dad had a great sense of humor, and he was always telling jokes and Puns and things were so much fun for him. He was accepting of all people, big and small, able or unable, and he was always willing to give you a chance. And he always ex loved hard work and doing it once and doing it right. In the 60s, my recollections were very little because I was very young, but I remember him playing basketball at Modesto High School and the smell of the gym. We moved to St. Francis Avenue in 1966 and to the ranch 
and so dad could be a rancher again, be out on the farm. He loved to take drives. We'd go to the beach and have picnics. We'd go to Yosemite. He uh, loved the theater. We'd go to San Francisco, watch the Oakland A's ball games, the Giants. Um, he just had a very full, well-rounded life, and he exposed us to a lot of different things that I so appreciate, and I know that you all care and love him for as well. Thank you, and have thank you for coming. Next to my father, Jack Leach was the most important male figure in my life. He was my teacher, my coach, my mentor, my friend. He gave me a love of sports, especially baseball, as well as music, and inspired me to be a writer, thanks to our elementary school book reports. I have many fond memories of the things Jack did for us kids at Garrison Elementary School. The after-school rec program, hoppy ta, yo-yo competitions, marbles, track, and doing the hokey pokey. We did some really unique things that you definitely could not do today. We rode our bikes into the fields around the school to collect butterflies. We then made our own killing jars with formaldehyde. We built a fort behind the school. We all cut wood and pounded nails. It seemed like the catwalk was six feet off the ground. He and Mrs. Allen staged productions of the HMS Pinafore and Tom Sawyer. Because Jack was involved, us boys got involved. We all joined chorus. I actually had the role of Ben Rogers and got to sing a solo. Parents and the entire school were involved in performing, making costumes, and building sets. I was inspired to be a teacher, thanks to Jack. When I was getting my elementary credential, I met with Jack and visited his classroom many times. But it was baseball that had the biggest impact on me, thanks to Coach Leach. Our A-team won the city championship when I was in sixth grade. Jack had a little green MG convertible that after games, we would all pile into the back and ride from Pikes Park to his duplex on Tully. We could never do that today. He then coached our Babe Ruth All-Stars, along with my dad who coached our team. When I returned to Modesto, I played adult city softball here at Davis Park on the Ozone Pirates with George Rogers, Chad Hanna, and Tom Myers. We played against Jack's team, the Antiques. Jack also introduced me to senior softball. We'd see each other at tournaments every year. He won many championship rings and was inducted into the Stanislaus Senior Softball Association Hall of Fame. Around that time, I decided to organize a reunion of Garrison kids. In the morning, we'd go to Pikes Park and practice a little softball. We'd then go over to Jack's for a barbecue and potluck. Later on, Paul and Karen Cornwell hosted a few gatherings. We did that for a number of years. Former students from all over the state joined us. Jim Chambers came all the way from Pennsylvania. Our last gathering was last year after Jack had moved into the garden. I hope every kid has someone in their life like Jack Leach. It's a real game changer. Good afternoon. Paul Cornwell is up next. Paul says Jack introduced him to baseball at Garrison School and showed him how to play the game the right way. The baseball lessons took root and flourished with Paul. He went on to win a baseball scholarship to college and then coached high school baseball for over 33 years. He attributes choosing to be a coach to Jack's influence. Paul is followed by Dan Spies, another of Jack's Garrison baseball protégés. Jack Leach was a teacher, a coach, and a devoted family man. To me, great teachers, coaches, coach their students, and great coaches teach their student athletes. 
Jack was both. He was my fifth grade teacher and sixth grade little league coach. In seventh grade, Jack coached the Babe Ruth All-Star team where we went to the state playoffs. By the end of that year, Jack had instilled in me the importance of an education and love of the sport of baseball. I remember by the end of seventh grade, there was a list of words that Jack had emphasized pertaining to both teaching and coaching. I have used all these words while teaching and coaching throughout my career. Teamwork, discipline, communication, honesty, accountability, and hard work every day. Jack played both fast pitch and slow pitch softball throughout the years. In 1989, he began playing senior softball. Around this time, he became one of the founders of the Stanislaus Senior Softball Association. In 1999, he was elected to the Stanislaus Senior Softball Hall of Fame. He played fast pitch softball in the Modesto City Leagues and the SOS, SOS Leagues over the years. I wish to thank Jack for his positive influence on me and so many of his students over the many years of teaching. He will be missed. My name is Dan Spies, and I wish I was there with you today. In a way, recalling thoughts about Jack is very easy, but at the same time, the reality of the situation is difficult. I want to express thoughts and observations primarily about Jack as a coach and his tremendous influence, but also throw in some other observations. Jack was the new student teacher at Garrison, quickly making himself a fixture. My first recollection was how as a student teacher and then later as a teacher, students gravitated toward him. My first encounter was when he became the after-school recreation director. He was the new fifth grade teacher. I was in sixth grade. I remember him changing into his recreation clothes in the hallway bathroom and emerging with those khaki pants with the buckle in the back just above the pockets. Why do people remember those kinds of things? After changing, he was ready then to take on the recreation duties. This involved making sure everything was in order on the playground, taking care of any discipline problems. But for most of us, and most importantly, it involved him playing football or basketball with us. What a great way for Jack to get to know us and us him. That next summer after the school year, he coached the Garrison B team, while us 11-year-olds and a few 12-year-olds played on the A team and unfortunately became accustomed to losing nearly every game, sometimes unmercifully. The next summer, Jack took over coaching the A-team when his B-team players rolled up to the A-team. The kids that rolled up had been coached by Jack and were solid in fundamentals. Things were different. There was great attention to detail. Just like John Wooden at UCLA, Jack, when handing out our uniforms, showed us how to put them on the right way. He wanted us to look good. He wanted every player to wear sleeves under their uniform tops that matched the uniform. If someone didn't have sleeves or couldn't get sleeves somehow, they showed up for him. I recall him saying one time that if you want to play good, you need to look good. Among many other things, Jack taught us detail and preparation. As 11 and 12 year olds, we just thought we were playing baseball and that's how it was done but important lessons were being taught. I remember distinctly Jack telling me to practice between practices, to get together with a couple of other outfielders and hit fly balls to each other. I remember him asking me if I practiced the piano between lessons. Of course, I said yes. Jack said it was the same thing, practice between regular practices. Again, detail and preparation. We did well that first season, uh, Jack coached the A-team. This time we were the winning team on the side of lopsided victories. I think being on the other side in previous seasons made us a little humbler. 
Jack wanted us to rest before games. I remember taking a shower and then lying on my bed to rest before each game. Jack had to show up at game times at least an hour earlier than game time, as I recall. This was time to take infield, outfield, and two rounds of batting practice, which always ended with a sacrifice bunt and a drag bunt. As the other team arrived for the game, we were ready to go and warmed. As the customary infield that each team took immediately before the game occurred, you could sense the feeling of the other team as we took infield and outfield with what seemed like precision. We did well that season and worked our way to the city championship. I distinctly remember after winning the game that sent us to the championship that Jack said the other team we beat was better than us. I was incredulous. Well, that word wasn't in my vocabulary at 12, but looking back on it, that's how I felt. How could your own coach say the other team was better than us? That statement from Jack stayed with me all these years, actually 65 years. It took many years to realize what Jack was really saying was that we outplayed the better team. And that quite simply can be attributed to the attention to detail and the preparation resulting from Jack's coaching. Or, as Gary Constable said when I told him the story, that's why you play the game. Oh, we didn't win that championship game, but that was on us as players. My parents attended every game and even some of the practices. I remember my mother, who didn't know a lot about baseball, once saying that Jack stood up for his players. Jack knew baseball and knew the rules of the game. If there was a misinterpretation of the rules by the umpires, he was there to offer correction. He was there to protect the integrity of the game, and as players, we saw that in action. At one of Garrison's reunions, I saw a side of Jack that seemed uncustomary, but funny. Jack, my wife Debbie, and I were sitting at a table on the patio at Paul Cornwell's. We were chatting about Chico State, where Jack, Debbie, and I graduated. Somehow the conversation turned to the fact that Jack and I had been in fraternities and Debbie a sorority. When Jack asked Debbie what sorority, and she replied, Alpha Chi, Jack scooted his chair closer to Debbie and said, the Alpha Chi's were the best looking girls on campus. And they were when Debbie and I attended Chico as well. I'll close with this. I've read that everyone, especially kids, need someone other than their parents that they feel accountable to. It might be an aunt or an uncle, a neighbor, a teacher, or a coach, but it needs to be someone that would approve of your actions, sort of a conscience that stays with you. For so many of us, Jack was that person. What a privilege for us to be in the right place at the right time to have him in our lives. Now, let's go watch Field of Dreams. We have heard some eloquent statements about Jack's teaching and coaching at Garrison. It's a testament to the effectiveness of Jack's work with children and young people that many of his students have stayed in touch with him for over 65 years until the end of his life. In fact, Ken White saw him shortly before his passing. Ken has also included Jack and his wife Corny in at least one of the many books he has written. Garrison was the start of Jack's work in education, but he went on from there to achieve many milestones in his career, all completed with a level of excellence and humanity that he displayed at Garrison. Over his career, Jack was an elementary teacher, a special education teacher, an elementary principal, an elementary school district superintendent, a high school coach, and a school psychologist. Jim Alexander will be describing an open classroom project that he, Jack, 
and others developed in the early 70s. It was a very innovative approach to elementary education at the time. Jim Alexander, uh, I worked with Jack when I came into Modesto at, Mar at uh, James Marshall. And while there, uh, Jack uh, and I and Mary Oakland and Dale Bitter uh, began to have this idea that we would be able to be a little bit more effective teaching the kids that we had if we could deal a little more effectively with the materials that we were given. Uh, and so we began to have the idea of developing a, a team teaching operation. At this time, we had Bert Corona and Arnie Gowdy and Jim Enox at the central office, and they had established a policy where if teachers had an idea about something that would enhance their program, but they didn't have money for it or it wasn't in the budget, they could make an application to this committee and you would be able to, uh, if approved, be given what monies you felt you needed. We were thinking of joining our rooms together and changing the materials, reading materials, uh, so that uh, they were more individualized and that we had different emphasis. Uh, mine was like social studies and Jack's was like uh, language or reading, Mary Oakland's was math. And uh, so we came up with the idea that we would tear apart all of these reading workbooks and so forth and separate them and we needed um, ways to store the material so that the students could be able to access them independently. And we came up with this idea of building uh, a series of cabinets, individual cabinets, uh, shelves. And they uh, agreed that this was a workable solution. So as school let out in the summer, we got the lumber and then went out into Jack's uh, ranch or house. And in the uh, workshop, we built these uh, and worked to uh, have them all set up for the coming year. And uh, as we began to think about it, moving uh, the kids, rather than going out the door uh, of our adjacent rooms, it would be nice if we could just uh, not have the wall between the rooms. So we asked, could you uh, knock out the wall? Well, they didn't want to knock out the whole wall, but they put a sliding uh, door uh, in uh, between our rooms. And so that's the way we would be able to move from one side to the next. And of course, uh, Jack uh, and I, uh, we were big time into uh, reading. Uh, and uh, Jack had found uh, some place to sustain silent reading. And so he would have the students that would come back in and they would be sitting down, but not just necessarily at desk. What we did was to make sure that they enjoyed reading and would read, we just put pillows, uh, comfy chairs, and all these things around the room, and they were allowed to bring in anything that they wanted to read, uh, and we did bring some things in also. But there were car magazines, motorcycle magazines, things that appealed to a little about everybody. And uh, when we would come back in, and uh, if Jack would say it was time for sustained silent reading, and the place would be absolutely still uh, for however long we decided to do it. And as uh, we were working on this, at the same time at the district level, there was the movement for the development of the open plan along more of the English school uh, style. And uh, we were working uh, on the district committee at that. And as the school year ended, uh, uh, Mary Oakland was very uh, influential in the committee working on the, at the district level. And so what happened was that uh, we thought we would apply uh, to the uh, open plan school that was going to be opening at uh, Fairview. So uh, at this time, uh, Jack, I think, was finishing his 
counseling degree, and so uh, he left, uh, actually I think he left Modesto City Schools at that time, and the rest of us, uh, Tom Knowles, myself, Mary Oplin, uh, we ended up at the uh, Open Plan School, uh, but we continued with our uh, association, I continued with our association with Jack, with the poker, and the rest, for the next 40 some odd years. It's been enjoyable. Miss him a great deal. Jack was a multi-talented person. He played softball into his 80s. When it became clear to him that he was going to have to reduce his softball playing due to physical constraints, he turned to music. Like the organizer and mentor he always was, he organized a ukulele group. We practiced at Gotchalk's Music Center and had occasional gigs at retirement centers around the county. At its height, there were 18 people in the ute group, plus Rosetta on the piano and Bert occasionally on drums. I had just retired when Jack recruited me for the ute group, but I told him, I can't play the uke. The next day he showed up with a loner uke and gave me my first lesson. Can't was not a word that he used much, and he helped others not to use it much either. Playing in that group with his leadership was a blessing to me for the next 12 years. It's among the many things for which I always will be thankful to Jack. Along with playing uke, Jack decided he wanted to play in the Gotchalks bands. To my knowledge, he had never played a band instrument before. He played uh, piano, and guitar, and uke very well, but I don't believe he ever played a band instrument until he got Allison's saxophone out of the closet and started to practice. C.K. Gottschalk is up next to tell us about Jack's band experience. Sometimes I don't know what I'm doing Sometimes all my days are filled with rain as I travel down life's highway, things ain't going my way cause there's always someone swerving in my lane. Keep a swerving in my lane, hands cause lots of danger. I'm a walking on my horn, I'm a shoot the finger. Keep switching on my bright lights, but you're just too dim to know. When you're swerving on my highway, you're running someone off the road. The day you drove away, I thought I'd never could love another. How else could I feel? Now when you run into me, I cannot believe I could not see. You're all taped up, but no one's at the wheel. Keep swerving in my lane, hands cause a lot of danger. I'm a cussing out your name, I'm shooting you the finger. I keep switching on my bright lights, but you just too dim to know. When you're swerving on life's highway, carrying someone off the road. Hi, I'm CK Gottschalk. I first met Jack in the 60s, maybe it was the 70s. We met at a poker table, wagering nickels, dimes, and quarters with a group of teachers. The group met weekly and still does, though membership has changed through the decades. As a kid, Jack took piano lessons. I don't know what his musical experiences were through high school and early adulthood, but in his post-collegiate years, I know he had the desire to learn some other musical instruments. Through the years, he tried the saxophone, the clarinet, 
the banjo, the ukulele, the guitar, the trombone, and probably some other ones. My first musical connection with Jack was when he joined the New Horizons band, sometimes in the early 2000s. He played tenor sax in that band. The band met twice a week all year long, and still does. In odd-numbered months, the band prepares programs for presentations in even-numbered months to various senior citizens' organizations and facilities. Occasionally, Jack and I would practice together, the two of us, he and the tenor, me and the alto, to sharpen our skills. Jack had a lot of fun playing ukulele. He would <coughs> hold practice sessions for friends he'd recruit. Uh, he even held practice sessions for those friends in his facility at Samaritan Village. I remember one of their ukulele programs in the backyard of his St. Francis Street home. It was a lot of fun watching them, and they had a lot of fun strumming. In summation, Jack did enjoy learning, playing, and sharing music with his family and friends. We sung all our songs and we'll sing them again Of the people we've met and the places we've been of some of the stories that come to our mind And a lot of good people we're leaving behind So long, it's been good to know ya So long, it's been good to know ya So long, it's been good to know ya What a long, long time since I've been home and I got to be drifting along. Jack knew how to do many things. You can see some of his woodwork done on the lathe out on the display tables. Another garrison ball player, Lee Delano, is up next to tell us about Jack's various hobbies. These, coupled with all his other endeavors, cause us to think of him as a Renaissance man. Hello, my name is Lee Delano. I had the great honor of being one of Jack's first students at Garrison School when he started his career there in 1957. Jack not only was our teacher, but he was our coach. And it was wonderful to have him there teaching us. He earned our respect and our devotion through the years. You may not know um, that our Little League team, I had played two years before Jack came to Garrison, and we were in last place both years. Last place. Jack came to coach us, and we went from last to going to the city championship. And that was no fluke, right? He had other teams following us that won the championship. Our team was just awestruck and we couldn't win that game. But it was unbelievable that we went from last place to the championship game. And as you might have heard from Ken, uh, Jack also led the students in a play. <clears throat> and there were two or three of those as time went on. I was not involved in those, uh, but uh, I met Jack in downtown Modesto during the civil rights movement. And he encouraged me to go sing with him as we walked down the street singing, We Shall Overcome, because of his interest 
in, in the civil rights of everyone. As you know, Jack was a superb athlete, and later uh, I played softball uh, in a city league also, not with Jack's team, but occasionally we'd meet as opponents, and I always knew his prowess on the field and was always fearful of his bat and uh, could always respect his fielding expertise. He, he did watercolors for a while. That is, he was a painter. He liked to paint. And it was, again, his imagination, and he got to, to, to draw and paint things uh, in his own style even though I've never seen any of his works ever posted or preserved. Uh, and another thing, one of his other interests was birding. I remember him taking me on a field trip once, and we were uh, out scouting for certain birds in our area. <clears throat> As you might have heard or seen, uh, various... Uh, um, old students would meet with Jack at Pikes Park and we would practice softball and Jack would be the pitcher. Now in Little League, he would pitch us batting practice. Now Jack would pitch harder than any of our opponents would actually pitch, but he made us stand in that batting box and and experience a, a faster pitch and get us used to doing that. And then he'd limit our number of, of pitches. That is, we'd go in the batter's box and we'd get three pitches, and then two pitches, and then one pitch. So we learned to hit whatever was pitched to us, and um, it was great fun, and we learned a significant amount while playing. After our little Pikes Park thing, where Jack was pitching to us some 60 years later, we would adjourn to his house at St. Francis and have a little barbecue and enjoy the afternoon. Um, and you can see that uh, hopefully in that photo that I'm going to insert here. And uh, at his property, I went into his barn and I found uh, awards for his woodworking. And I think there are some pieces out on the tables uh, indicating that he did woodworking uh, as one of his many talents. And then, of course, uh, one day after that softball day, uh, he would give us jars of pickles that the cucumbers that he would grow, cure, and pack. And so another talent that we didn't know he had. And he enjoyed his wine. As any of you may have known, he would like to drink his Gallo Red, but certainly he liked to go to the Nikau Winery out off Mariposa Road and enjoy the old Zen. A true Renaissance man with many interests, talents, humor, and abilities that I had the pleasure and honor of knowing and respecting. I love you, Jack, and will remember you always. We've heard about the many roles Jack played in his life. He was a husband dad, a mentor, a teacher, a coach, a ball player, a musician, a friend to many, a confidant to some. One fellow told me that Jack was a surrogate dad to him. He was a big brother to me. When I think about Jack and his impact on the world around him, it can be stated in one simple sentence. He helped people improve their lives. And he did it with humor, compassion, and fun activities. That brings me to one more area of Jack's life we haven't yet explored. Poker. 
Tom Knowles and I are up next to tell you about Jack and poker. Good afternoon. Jack had a poker game weekly for about the last 40 years of his life, at least. There was a group that played poker around at various garages and patios and people's homes, but it wasn't until Jack gave us a permanent place to play that a consistent group of players coalesced and played there every week. Right after he retired, Jack spent weeks remodeling a building on his property, an old building that had just sat there for years. He remodeled it and turned it into a poker room just for us to play. It was a nickel-dime quarter game then, and it's a nickel-dime quarter game today when we play in Dick Bradley's garage. And that's because we realized after a while that it, it really wasn't about the poker. It was a social group. And Jack uh, reinforced that with us many times over the years. In fact, for more than 40 years around that poker table, we shared news of marriages and divorces, of births and deaths, family news, national news, and insults. Yes, you heard me right, insults. For those of you that don't already know, trading insults in a friendly, humorous, gentle way is the way that men bond. And believe me, we did a lot of bonding out there in that poker room. I always remember when Corny would come to the door because she had something to say to Jack and there'd be a knock on the door. And the next thing we would hear is, watch the language, boys, I'm coming in. It was a tight-knit group there that Jack had started. And so tight that we had a, uh, we developed a charter in 1990. I'd like to read you a couple of parts of that charter. The first part is part of the preamble. It goes like this. Having met for over 17 years on an informal basis, we have now seen fit to formalize our association and become the Modesto Maledictology and Poker Society. Article three from the charter reads like this. The spiritual leader of the society shall be known as the grand maledictator and patron of poker. He shall hold the position for life and Jack Leach shall be the first to be appointed. We not only, Jack took copies of that. He just took it on a scratch, scratch paper copy of that um, charter and had it calligraphied. You can see the, the master on the uh, table out, outside where the articles are. And he not only had that big master copy, poster size made, he had individual sizes made for, uh, individual small ones made for each player. And they all had that same beautiful calligraphy work on them. We also had our ties. Uh, you'll see the one on the table outside. Um, our poker society ties. We would wear them on um, special occasions. For example, the poker society Christmas party. Tie was required. That tie. We had a sign in the poker room that read, Playing poker isn't a matter of life and death. It's more important than that. I think we're all very grateful to Jack for what he's done in many ways over the years. But with regard to this poker, I, I personally, and I think all of us are so grateful that he gave us a place and created an atmosphere where friendships 
could begin and develop. One of the poker players, uh, Tom Knowles, has written a song about the poker and about Jack. I think the depth of feeling that, he's, that he shows in his song is something that we all feel. So here he is, Tom Knowles. Take a listen. Jack built us a room just for poker. We played there most every Wednesday night. He's our grand mal dictator, our judge, our crusader, whose rulings were final, wrong, or right. There's no other place that I know of where you're free to slander or offend. Though cheating was discouraged, lying was encouraged, I wish those evenings could never end. And Forty years and more of playing poker, I ought to teach you something, but I won't. Cause you don't have to think, you just like cuss, spit and drink. They'll call you a screw if you don't. We all know that nothing lasts forever. But just for once I'd like to go back. To playing cards with my friends Where the laughter never ends Just one more hand of poker with Jack So here's to our grand mal dictator The honorable patron of poker May you always rest in peace May your memories never cease May all your hands contain at least one joker. Oh, thanks for everything, Jack. Happy trails. Happy trails. Ooh. Happy trails to you. Until we meet again. Happy trails to you, keep smiling until then, who cares about the clouds when we're together, just sing a song and drink the sunny weather, happy trails to you, till we meet again. Happy trails to you until we meet again. Happy trails to you. Keep smiling until then. Who cares about the clouds when we're together? Just sing a song and drink the sunny weather. Happy trails!